Aruba, Jamaica. Florida Keys. Oh, Kokomo. What do we do with you? In 1988, the Beach Boys were long past their prime. Though one of the greatest bands of the 60s, they had faded out from the charts under the wave of changing social trends and the mental breakdown of their leader, sensitive pop genius Brian Wilson. Brian's cousin, frontman Mike Love, winds up taking the reins of the band. They keep making records through the 70s and 80s, with and without Brian at various points, but they only rarely attain even middling success and mostly become a fixture of the nostalgia circuit. Until Kokomo. A one-off soundtrack single appended to the mediocre Tom Cruise movie Cocktail, it becomes an out-of-nowhere smash hit and launches the Beach Boys back into the limelight. Despite its continuing popularity, it remains the most polarizing song in their catalog. To some, it is a breezy, enduring 80s classic by one of the best rock groups in history. To others, it is the selloutest of sellout garbage, a great band hollowed out into a soulless plastic shell reduced to soundtracking the baby boomers' sad, paunchy middle age. Personally, I cannot hate Kokomo. It is one of the first songs I ever loved as a child. I can sing every word. It's probably not a convincing argument to the haters, but wherever you stand on it, there is something that everyone agrees on. It is not the worst thing the Beach Boys ever made. The Beach Boys quickly slapped together an album, mostly of soundtrack singles they'd already released. It wasn't very good, but it went platinum off the strength of Kokomo. A humongous triumph for Mike Love, as Brian had little involvement, being still under the abusive conservatorship of his therapist Eugene Landy. Mike had always been overshadowed by Brian, so this was finally his moment. And the next one would be even better, because as Brian slowly disentangled his legal affairs, this would be the first Beach Boys album with no Brian whatsoever. This would be entirely the product of Mike Love and producer Terry Melcher, the team that made Kokomo. It would be, in Mike Love's own words, the quintessential soundtrack of summer. It would establish Mike Love as not just one of Brian's collaborators, but a hit-making force in his own right. It is one of the worst goddamn things I've ever heard. People all around the world in every nation like to get together for some excitation. Beach Boys gave creative control to Mike Love and the result was 1992's Summer in Paradise, the unquestionable low point of the Stamos years. A humongous critical and commercial bomb, it quite possibly murdered the entire boomer music revival craze just on its own. Mike Love may have wanted it to feel like an endless summer beach party, but if it evoked anything beachy, it was a rotting whale carcass that washed ashore. Hey now. Well, it's a love thing. People, it is so bad. The Beach Boys wipe out. This is train records. Mike Love, history's greatest monster. Maybe that's overselling it, but there's no denying that he has one of the worst reputations in music. So much so that it's in the first paragraph of his Wikipedia entry. I know Mick Jagger won't be here tonight. He's always been chicken shit to get on stage with the Beach Boys. Tales of Mike Love's petty dickery and shameless pandering could fill this entire video. He has unequivocally been cast by history as the villain of the Beach Boys. That band's story also features Brian's abusive father Murray, his abusive psychiatrist Dr. Landy, and Charles fucking Manson, and yet somehow Mike Love towers above them all. No, I don't like Mike Love at all. There are some accounts that defend Mike especially the ones commissioned by Mike himself. It is true that he co-wrote some of the band's biggest and best songs. He did help make Brian's artsy experiments accessible to a wide audience. He's credited as the fun and good time spirit of the band, and it was under his stewardship that they became one of the most reliable touring acts around, and where they gained the title America's Band. But to the public at large, he will only ever be a commercial hack, a stifling impediment to Brian's creativity and a giant gaping asshole. Oh, I am very much a ladies' man. I, I admit to that. Life in prison as ladies' man. No, I don't like Mike Love at all. But he wrote Kokomo. And Brian was MIA. So it was Mike's record. What happens when you give creative control to the band member who is the least talented, the least ambitious creatively, and by some distance the least likable as a human being? Let's find out. Here's the first single. This is a cover of Sly and the Family Stone's 1969 hit, Hot Fun in the Summertime. It's a very warm, lighthearted, relaxing song, and 
I'm not going to tell you the Beach Boys do a great version of it, but it is honestly the best song on the album. Yet it did very little for the band commercially. See, if I had to guess, I'd bet the Beach Boys were hoping to keep exploiting one of the most powerful forces known to man, Boomer Nostalgia. Yeah, the 80s were extremely good to the 60s. Pretty much everyone who was big in the 60s who was still around had a hit, including some who'd been inactive for more than a decade, some who'd never had a pop hit at all, some who were dead. No other decade has been that kind to its veteran acts, certainly not the 90s. We were sick of that shit by 1992. There were a couple comebacks, but for the most part, late career hits were hard to come by. Besides, nostalgia is for two decades ago, not three. We were bringing back the 70s by that point. So you could blame its failure on changing trends, but it's easier to just point out the obvious, which is that the production sounds like ass. Yeah. Yes, the song's a proven hit, and the singing and harmonies are good as ever, but the drums are way too loud, everything sounds synthetic and fake in a way you don't want from the Beach Boys. For a song about summer, all the warmth has been sucked out of it. It sounds very mechanical. This was one of the first albums made on Pro Tools, but I doubt the program is to blame. I think this was just yet another example of boomers not understanding technology. Also, what is this video? You guys are 50. Knock that shit off. Oh, I am very much a ladies' man. I admit to that. Life in prison as ladies' man. But that's the first song. Let's check out the second. It is also a cover. In fact, it's a remake of the very first Beach Boys song, Surfin'. Surfin' is the only life, the only way for me now. Surf. Surf. With my pop. It was first attempt. It was not a hit. It's primitive. If you're gonna modernize one of your songs, that one makes perfect sense. So let's see what they did with it. Okay, so uh, I guess their idea for modernizing surfing for the 90s was let's make it sound as much as possible like the 90210 theme. This is infinitely more dated than the surf doo-wop of the original. Like you can pinpoint the exact year this was made, right down to the I'm Too Sexy drums. Actually I don't know if 90210 is the right comparison. I'm I'm actually struggling to figure out what TV show theme this reminds me of. I asked my friends on Facebook, and one suggestion I got was the Baywatch theme. Hmm. About that. I can't wait till summer, cause it's gonna yeah. be a summer of love. Hey now. Well, it's a love thing. Let's get to this disaster. This is song number three on the album, Summer of Love. Girls are always ready for a summer of love. So offensive, I don't even know where to start. But do you would be so very cool. Okay, so part of the reason everyone hates Mike Love is that he's a known Republican. However, let it not be said that he cannot reach across the aisle. The only real public stance he's ever taken was in the mid-80s, when he was the only rock star to support Tipper Gore's censorship campaign. A true bipartisan douche. I bring it up because I guess he thought music in the 80s was getting too dirty. But no Madonna or Prince song has ever made me feel grosser than listening to 50-year-old Mike Love rap about bikini babes. Like, the Beach Boys became unpopular in the late 60s because when the hippie movement took hold, the Beach Boys started looking like a bunch of preppy douchebags. I dig a French bikini. Now Mike was in fact a preppy douchebag and you can hear it in his lyrics, but in context it sounds like innocent fun. Possibly because he wasn't a creepy old man. But we could get together if you come back. You do realize you're not 22 anymore, Mike. You're not even 42. No one wants to see you ruin the sight of all these beautiful women with your dirty old man stink. Oh, I am very much a ladies' man. I, I admit to that. Life in prison as ladies' man. I don't you let me take you on a love vacation. Watching him try to be seductive at that age is... It's now, Wait, was that a goddamn record scratch on a Beach Boys song? <sighs> so I know what you're asking, what's with the music video, with the Baywatch credits over it and everything? Well, this video was inexplicably shot and aired as part of an actual Baywatch episode. From 1995, 
three years after the album crashed and sank like the Titanic. Now you'd think even Mike Love would have the sense to let this fucking piece of shit die by that point. Well, this song's story is crazy enough to be its own episode. First off, it began life as a sequel to Do the Bartman, but Fox eventually rejected Mike Love's track after the initial Simpsons merch bonanza gave way to good taste. At that point, Mike took over rapping duties himself, and even though this album flopped like a dead flounder, a year later, Summer of Love wound up on the Baywatch soundtrack, probably because it name-checks Baywatch directly. California dream, Baywatch every day. Yes, under Mike Love's tenure, the Beach Boys, one of the greatest bands in history, became artists on the same level as David Hasselhoff. Also, there's a whole lot of self-references. Like to get together for some excitation. Excitations, Surfing USA. Surfing USA. A whole ton of these late stage Beach Boys songs are just them reliving their glory days rather than actually coming up with something new. Who do they think they are? Disney? Also, Brian had rejoined the band by that point, which means we get the pleasure of watching melancholic Brian Wilson humiliate himself by busting a groove to Mike Love's Sing Speak Rap. <sighs> the best thing I can say about it is this. It's only the second worst of the three Beach Boys rap songs I've heard. This band. Now that we've gotten through the brutal opening stretch, I can tell you that the bulk of the album is made up of two things. One, shit covers. More than half of Summer in Paradise are his remakes of either their own songs or old doo-wop standards. Bad enough that these classics have been remade with Richard Marks' production under them, they have the fucking temerity to rewrite a lot of the lyrics. Most people would tell you that Under the Boardwalk was already perfect, but it needed that Mike Love touch, I guess. The worst covers of the Shangri-Las remember Walking in the Sand. The original is really great. It's a, it's a very early 60s, over-the-top teen melodrama. The Beach Boys version sounds like this. A weird prog rock organ, then a big sexy sax solo. I give it credit for weirdness, except it's underpinned by the same ugly drum machine and the same dead vocals. So that's one part of the album. Two, shit Kokomos. Mike Love once infamously told Brian Wilson, don't fuck with the formula. And so he has not. He tries to recreate the magic of Kokomo some four or five times during this record. The most blatant is Island Fever. It opens with the same Casio percussion, then the same unaccompanied vocals, then the same processed tropical instruments. Yeah, this sucks. You might hate Kokomo, but none of these knockoff Kokomos are good enough to hate. Neither this nor any of the other fake Kokomos comes close to recapturing the magic. I mean, a lyric like, Bermuda, Bahama, come on pretty mama, that's lightning in a bottle. You don't write something like that more than once. Now there is a wealth of information about the recording of Pet Sounds, the Beach Boys' masterpiece. It will not surprise you to know that that is not true of Summer in Paradise. I scoured all the available info, and despite the Beach Boys being one of the biggest rock bands in history, I found very little. Apparently, personality conflicts led to founding member Al Jardine being fired and then rehired during production, which may explain why everyone sounds so miserable, but that's all I know. I even bought Mike Love's bitter, insufferable memoir, but uh, he is clearly ashamed of the record because, despite it being his baby, he barely mentions it a single time. The one song he does mention is the only one that stayed in the Beach Boys set list, that's the title track, Summer in Paradise. Mike mentions it when he's talking about his politics, which he's evasive about, but he does want you to believe that he's not some far-right shithead. And as evidence, he brings up a cause he says he's very passionate about, environmentalism. That's the message of the song. It's also the message of the Baywatch episode they were in, where they perform it. It's called Summer in Paradise, and it deals with what happened to the environment and how we need to take special care of what we once took for granted. Okay, fine. Environmental song. I can do that. Nice change of pace. Let's hear it. Uh, 
Okay, this environmental song appears to be just you milking the legend of the Beach Boys even more. I mean, it does get to all the Save the Earth shit after that, but I'm just amazed we had to sit through four bars of the Beach Boys self-cannibalizing yet a fucking again before we got there. Even when it's about the Earth, it's about the Beach Boys, by which I mean my club's ego, of course. And come on, people, if we don't save the Earth, where else is Mike Love gonna drink wine coolers and creepily ogle 20 year olds? I'm kidding. Mike Love doesn't drink. So that's pretty much the album, except for the final track. It is yet another remake of an older Beach Boys song. That song is Forever, a really pretty and fairly beloved deep cut by the Beach Boys drummer Dennis Wilson, widely regarded as his best. If every word I said could make you Dennis died in 1983, so someone else will have to take lead vocal duty on this one. Let's give it a listen. Okay. Want to introduce our part-time substitute once in a while when he's got nothing better to do in the summer. In the early 80s, Beach Boys touring guitarist Jeff Foskett became friends with a young, up-and-coming actor named John Stamos. Stamos, a Beach Boys superfan, used that connection to meet Mike Love. The two of them quickly became fast friends, and Stamos began occasionally touring with them as their drummer in 1985. They are just kindred spirits, in that I've heard you wouldn't want to get too close to Stamos either, let's leave it at that. The two have a perfectly symbiotic friendship. Through Mike Love, Stamos found an avenue to live out his rock star fantasies, and as his star continued to rise, Mike Love gained a key ally in keeping the band visible to a younger audience. This is all to say that John Stamos is barely a beach boy. He's a beach boy as much as Spike Lee is a New York Nick. He's a mascot at best. Charles Manson had more creative input in the band than he's ever had. He tours with them sometimes when he's not busy with his actual job, but he has never performed on a Beach Boys record. Except for this. Let me say this right now. This is not a Beach Boys song. Included on a Beach Boys album, it was written and originally performed by the Beach Boys, Stamos is accompanied by the Beach Boys in it, but it is not a Beach Boys song. It is a vanity project by a pretty boy TV actor, and it clearly was not intended for this album because it sounds like trash in a completely different way than the rest of the album sounds like trash. In fact, I know it wasn't intended for this album because it debuted three months before its release on an episode of Full House. You may remember that Uncle Jesse sang the song at his wedding, but this is from a later episode where it becomes Jesse and the Ripper's first single. And the plot of the episode is that Uncle Jesse has to stop the record company from turning it into a rap song. This is not only a sitcom plot, it's a stealth way to make this Brian Adamsy power ballad seem like the respectful version by comparison. This being on the album was clearly just a thank you to Stamos for the TV appearances by letting him think he's now a real Beach Boy. No, this is a performance by Jesse and the Rippers and don't you forget it. So that's the album. The fallout from this was bad. It didn't chart. Actual sales data is hard to find, but it definitely sold less than 100,000 copies. According to some sources, it sold less than 1,000 copies. At least one company went out of business because it tanked so hard and the Beach Boys didn't record any new material for 20 years. I can't imagine you'd want to listen to it after seeing this video, but if you're morbidly curious, you can head over to Spotify and then weep because it is not there. Spotify has every little scrap of studio outtake they recorded in 1963, but not this record. It's never been available on streaming. And unlike nearly every other Beach Boy CD, it was never reissued. That's why if you want a copy, you can go order one on Amazon for the low, low price of $100. Thankfully, people have uploaded it on YouTube for everyone to hear. Thank you very much, bootleggers. Now completionists can listen for themselves and realize there are better uses of their money. But if there is one silver lining about this album, it's this possibly apocryphal quote from Mike, who, according to Wikipedia, said that this album was an important exercise in continuity and unity. I don't know about unity, but continuity, certainly. 
This album came out 30 years into their career, and almost 30 years have passed since. And in that entire, almost 60 year span, Mike Love has never not been a dick. That's some continuity. Aloha, surfer dudes. Hey now. Well, it's a love thing.